Even the Anzacs pay respects and uh, see what it's all about, I guess. And so 90th anniversary too. Yeah. You've got to come for this, so this is why we're here. We're all, we're all um, based in London. There's five things to do, five big events uh, during one season. So this is probably the main main one, beer fest and all those sort of things as well. So that's why, yeah, we're, here. That's why we're here. It's a real Aussie pilgrimage, mate. <laughs> Every Aussie should do it. That's the Aussie right. Mecca. <laughs> Our Hajj, the Aussie Hajj. We should all do it. It's obviously grown yeah, over the last few years especially. Uh, my brother experienced it, I guess, uh, in the mid-90s and said uh, how great it was then or how moving it was. And uh, I think that the word's out, <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, the word is on the street and people want to you know, put that, that on their resume of experiences as Australians. What I can show you is this. That was given to my father by his mother to go to the war. His name was Rupert John Donaldson, but his father was a bank manager of the Bank of Australasia, Newtown, which no, other, no longer exists. I think the date there is 1913, uh, 13 or 14, and it's RJD, which was Rupert John Donaldson. So she says... The dear squatter from Mother, Bank of Australasia, Newtown, New South Wales. I can't quite decipher the date. But here is a photo of him about to embark to, I believe, to go overseas or to go to training. And this is he on the left. And he was a bugler in the First World War. He looks to me as though he should be going to the Cubs, not the Scouts. He doesn't look old enough. But obviously... You know, somebody should have sent him home and said, go back to your mother. Well, I made the decision uh, 11 years ago to retire as a solicitor and become a poet, you know, which isn't like the common path, I don't think. But uh, I think when you make that sort of decision, uh, you deserve you know, to get a little bit of uh, good fortune along the way. And this was the good fortune or the opportunity of me writing and reciting uh, at Gallipoli for the 90th anniversary. Um, I was asked... Uh, by someone who was involved in putting together the prelude to the dawn service, if I'd like to write a tribute. Uh, and I said, of course. I mean, no, how could you knock that back? But with that came a responsibility, you know, to write something that, that was fitting of the occasion. I don't know, there's a curiosity there about Gallipoli. It's like, you know, we've read about it, we've heard about it, you know, it's part of us all in, in some way, but there's that unfulfilled part that, that makes us want to come here. And I think that's why there's so many young people here this year. So, yeah, I mean, mixing amongst uh, my own tour group and also some of the young people that are here, uh, there's that great curiosity about what it is about Gallipoli, you know, that, uh, that thing that you can't quite put your hand on. It's a feeling. It's, uh, you know, when you first see the ridges and the Sphinx, it's, it's an eerie feeling. And... Uh, I think that when you leave this place, you leave just as a tiny bit different person uh, you were than when you actually arrived here. In one moment, you've picked up more about the Gallipoli legend than you would have ever in your lifetime had you not come here. Because you, you've seen where they could have run in shore, gentle slope, through those little low bushes, and then bang, you're faced with these really steep cliffs and of course Turks on top of them. But what made the Anzacs so um, heroic was that they just kept on going up those cliffs. They kept on going up despite the fact that there were machine guns and rifles shooting at them from the top. And that's where the legend started. Because a lot of people would have thought, if they landed on the wrong beach, they, they, could, they would have given up. In fact, Birdwood at the end of the first day said, I think we should retreat. We've made the wrong, you know, we made a big mistake with the wrong beach. But Hamilton, who was out here on a ship called the Queen Elizabeth, said, no, don't, no, we can't. You're there now, dig in. And one of the reasons is the Admiral said it'd be too difficult to get the boats back in, too much trouble, get all the little um, landing craft, and so they didn't. This is it. This is where we are right now. Right here, right now. That's Anzac Cove. So boats from um, little 
steam pinnaces and landing craft coming from the ships over there would have come right in here to Anzac Cove. And you're looking at it, you're looking exactly where they came. That strip of beach, 600 metres max, from Ari Bunu in the north down here to Hell Spit, this corner. And that is where they landed thousands. Can you imagine how crowded it would have been? Mind you, it was 25 metres wide, but that's where they landed all those thousands, 16,000. That plus North Beach, which we'll see in a minute, around the corner. That's really the sacred site, if you like, for Gallipoli, Anzac Cove. We sailed off for Gallipoli And how well I remember that terrible day How our blood stained the sand and the water And of how in that hell they called Sula Bay. We were butchered like lambs at the slaughter. Johnny Turk, he was white and he primed himself well. He showered us with bullets and he rained us with shell. And in five minutes flat, he'd blown us all to hell. Nearly blew us right back to Australia But the band played waltzing Matilda When we stopped to bury our slain oh, We buried ours and the Turks buried theirs That we started something I've always wanted to do. It's just tremendous. I just wish my family was with me. I brought a few artefacts. Uh, I brought a, a wallet that my grandmother, my obviously my father's mother, gave him to come away. I'm going to hold it the night of the, of the uh, 24th at the dawn service. And I've got a photo of him in that wallet going away and he Went as a bugler in the First World War and he looked as though he should have been going to the Cubs, not the Scouts, he didn't look old enough. My father joined at 15, seven months and landed here at 15, 10 months. Uh, I've got a letter that he, well, some notes he wrote in that particular diary, in which I'll show you. It was 15, 10 months or 15, 11 months, but uh, he landed here at that young age and he talks about the shelling of Lone Pine on that letter that I brought with me. Also talks about the snowstorm and writes about the evacuation. He was a bugler in the First World War. He couldn't sing Happy Birthday in tune, so I don't know how he blew the bugle. But reading the headstones and reading the words and inscriptions that mothers you know, put on their sons, gravestones, 17 year old kids and feeling that uh, you know there were some pretty brave and special people you know doing what they did uh, to give us the opportunity to uh, have the freedom to make this trip today. Going through the cemeteries and the graveyards and realising that these were the sons of mothers and that the mothers you know, had written the words to go on their son's grave never to, you know, never to see their boy again. I think that's like I, I looked around and there were so many mums and uh, females, I suppose, just finding themselves their own quiet moment to take it all in and uh, try and make sense of it, I guess, in a way. When you walk along Anzac Beach, it's such a, a sacred patch of pebble and shell grit and sand and whatever else, but it, it, it's such a, you know, a pivotal point in our history. It's such an important chapter that you do it for that reason. I mean, you just 
got to take your shoes off, walk on that beach, into the water, and close your eyes and think about it. I mean, there's nothing more. It's not complicated. It's just something that you feel compelled to do when you come here. Again, you know, you try and take yourself back. You try and imagine, you know, what it would have been like as, you know, Dawn was um, breaking over the Sphinx up there and uh, obviously, you know, there was a, um, a chaotic atmosphere or a, you know, a war going on around you. you. You just, I think it's, you know, part of human nature to, to think, well, you know, if I had have been in that position, uh, what would I have done? What would it have been like? Maybe that's another thing that these young Australian men and, and Australian women uh, come here for. They want to say, well, you know, how would I have felt in a situation like this? What decision would I have made? How would I have approached it? You know, to, to uh, have fought in a war with my mates and, uh, you know, and the soldiers dying around me to try and survive, to get through it, you know, to return to loved ones. Well, this is it. This is Anzac Cove. We're between Ari Bunu and Hell Spit. It's the stretch of beach where the Anzacs first landed. 4.30 on the 25th of April, 1915. The first boats ashore were for the 9th Battalion, the Queenslanders, and their first task before dawn was to climb these cliffs here. These formidable cliffs, which they had to scale in order to get up to Pluggy's Plateau and take out the first line of Turks. Because on Pluggy's Plateau, there were Turks that were shooting at them. They succeeded. They killed them by bayoneting or shooting them. And they got their first foothold up on Pluggy's Plateau. And they did all that in the first 30 minutes. Instead of giving up, realizing they're on the wrong beach, and it was an impossible task because of the steepness of the cliff, they said, we'll go for it. And that's what made the Anzac such a legend. They achieved the impossible. They landed and they scaled the cliffs and they entrenched into a position. I want to climb the terrain or you know, the similar, put myself in a similar situation as to what these young guys put themselves in uh, 90 years ago because I think that it's a, a worthwhile exercise. It would give you some sort of perspective of the enormous task and challenge that lay ahead of them. But the perspective is that I'm doing it you know, as a poet who is so very interested and inspired you know, by their effort that all I've got is a, you know, a backpack with a pen and a paper and a few other things in the back. I mean, they had bigger packs, I would say, and uh, under enemy fire, it was, it's cold, I mean, you, you know how cold it is here. I mean, the wind just cuts through you. You can imagine, you know, jumping in the ocean or coming out of the water with that, in those conditions and then, you know, having to climb up that ridge or that hill with the backpack under enemy fire. It just gives it a little bit of perspective, I think. And I think, uh, you know, it's not to say, oh, well, I would have been good enough or I could have got up that hill or, because I wouldn't, but it just, you know, it, it also satisfies a little bit of that curiosity. I believe Bean, who said they landed on the wrong beach. The country was unrecognisable. It was a terrible muddle. And other parts of the book, this is his official history, he says they landed on the wrong beach. Yeah. And Birdwood said, we've got to evacuate because we've landed on the wrong beach. And he's the commander of the, the Anzacs. Yeah. And he said, and, and then Hamilton wrote back to England and said, although they landed on the wrong beach, <laughs> right, it turned out to be an advantage because there were only something like company or two companies of the Turks here that they reckon there's about 160 Turks just here in the area from the 27th uh, regiment but um, it took them till about I didn't work out what was happening till about eight o'clock the first twig at about six o'clock about eight o'clock they started getting reinforced by ten o'clock they were coming so those fellas that got right up to the third ridge Tullik, Margots, Layla and Lutit and, and others like that they got up there before the Turks reinforced. You see, it was too late then. Yeah. They had one window of opportunity yeah, and it was, yeah, yeah. It was in, a, in a two or three hours. If they'd have yeah. been really yeah. lateral thinkers with great leadership, they could have they could have secured positions right up on the third ridge. 
but it was all ahead of plan. They just couldn't adjust to it. So if you can imagine, 4.30 I am, about 100 metres down there, the 9th Battalion landing craft, like a big white rowing boat you've seen in the AWM, that's where it scraped onto the stones and they all jumped out and they ran into those cliffs and worked out what to do next. The first thing they realised is, this is not what we're meant to be. <laughs> you know. And uh, But by, by the time the first boat struck the shore, the Turks started shooting. They had, they had among themselves, they said, wait, wait till they get within range and then we'll have much more effect. So they're being shot in the boats and they were shot as they got across the beach. And from then on, further down, which is why they call that Queensland Point, the ninth with the Queensland, they call it Queensland Point as well as Hell Spit. That's where the um, Queenslanders land. So two or three boats from the 9th Battalion and the 10th Battalion, and then up here, the 11th and the 12th. All from the 3rd Brigade, which was commanded by Sinclair McLagan, who's, who that ridge is named after up there. The first little ridge that goes to Pluggy's Plateau, which is one of the first things they conquered within, within half an hour, by, by first light, really. The sun comes up, you just have a black outline of the ridge. And, and then slowly it gets lighter behind you, you see whether it is a ridge. And that's what they would have said. They would have said, my God, it's a hell of a ridge. <laughs> but they landed here basically in, in too dark to know that it was a real ridge. But they weren't put off, and that's the thing about it. I think that's why they uh, are so celebrated. But there were lots more shrubs and bushes, and yeah, they said without them to pull them up on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As we saw in the film Gallipoli, it was the uh, the athletic ones that joined up. And so the the Times wrote the story saying that there was a new race of athletes that had sprung onto the world stage, and they were the heroic Australians. And that's that's how the legend started. Ellis Ashmead Bartlett, then Charles Bean. They said they couldn't believe that they wouldn't give up. But they said, oh, we're Australians, we're colonials, we can do it, we can do anything. And you look around you now and you can see what an incredible challenge it must have been. Nobody in Turkish army can see a landing in Anzac. And even for five hours, four hours, we didn't know whether there was a serious landing in Anzac or a diversion. So actually, we don't say it in our official history, but we were late for Anzac. When Turks went to Anzac, it was three and a half hours later. So when Turkish reinforcements went to Anzac, three and a half hours passed and two Australian brigades already landed. Eight, nine thousand men landed. So we call it in military, you know, tactics. Bridgehead operation was already finished. So then, you know, it was impossible to, you know, push back. So we should have been there a bit earlier. The reason is we got confused. Turkish headquarters couldn't be sure when <coughs> reports started coming from Anzac. First report in the moonlight came before 3 a.m. And a captain there, three-star officer, I can see a lot of ships at sea before Ariburn headland. But Turkish headquarters, battalion commander said, no worry, they don't land there. It's not suitable, so no panic. So this shows uh, <coughs> Bert was very well surprised, you know, German General Sanders here in the campaign. And he, if Atatürk didn't, you know, move his man, uh, we would have lost Anzac. And today probably nobody would say we landed on the wrong beach. <laughs> well, pity we didn't know that. <laughs> pity we didn't know that there was only uh, you know, 200 Turks up on the ridges defending that part of the peninsula. Yeah, it was, it was a stuff up from the start. We landed in the wrong spot and uh, you know, it would have been a little easier somewhere else, but you know, it might not have won the war for us. Then again, it might. I mean, there's always the what ifs or maybes. You know, I mean, if we had known there were only 200 Turks up there before they were reinforced, of course, because they didn't know we were going to, where we were going to land, it might have been a different story. But it wasn't. It was what it was, and in the end, it was the fact that we, you know, stayed there under the under the uh, order of uh, you know the British Empire was more out of pride to save a loss of face than anything, which is the disgrace of, of the situation. I believe that's where the real sacrifice of human life came into it, which is hard to accept. I think they could have summed it up a lot earlier. Well, it fills in uh, a few of the, the missing pieces, and that's what you can actually feel uh, when you get here and, 
and what you can see you know, when you arrive at Anzac Cove. Uh, you know, I mean, it's one thing to read about it, but it's another thing to, to feel that, I guess, that hopelessness of, of you know, what these young Australians had to face 90 years ago. Uh, the fact that, and this was almost a, an unwinnable uh, situation, but we, in the process, and in the, I guess, you know, in the process of uh, defeat, we became, we grew up, we be, it was a chapter that, that uh, you know, that we look back on now and say, well, you know, this is where Australia became, you know, a, a country of, a, of, of young men and, and women, you know, who stood up for themselves and, and gave it their best shot. This is, um, that's the Anzacs arriving at Gallipoli in 1915, classic photograph, and it's the... 90th anniversary, 1915 to 2005. And so, commemorates the big day. Well, not my little, little grandson. Okay. Five, five change? You better give it a Five change? What's that? That's a 20. No, five. Just one of those. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Lovely. Thank you very much, sir. Ten. 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 Indirim yaparsan. Ten. Alacağım. Oh, ne yapıyorsun? Ne yapıyorsun? Sen mi burası? Değil abi. He's my friend. Yes, I know him about last five years. Each other's good friends, good friendships. He's a good boy. Ten. No, because it's only a little one. I understand that. Abla. Abla, bu şey diyor. Ten. No more. All fixed price. Ne, ne? Ten. 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 Huh? 19. Nah, of course. 1999. That's the discount. <laughs> the softest thing yes, about you is your teeth. Yes. You've got to be better. I don't like your teeth. I'm not just walking. So I'm not all of you. Oh, you're not out. Yeah. No, but I, I seriously, the big yeah, ones are 20. And that's yeah. only for my little I grandson. Understand. No, you, you're not. You, I don't think you're being converted because as I was shooting the film, the sweatshirt that I had had the Australian flag and I'm a Turk at Gallipoli shooting it because I wanted to identify with the other side what those tour members doing stripping their own badges and putting the Turkish badges I think it's a sense of identification it's a need and a willingness to identify with the other side to get to know the other side as much as their own side because by identifying the other side identifying and empathizing the other side doesn't jeopardize your enthusiasm for your own side it makes it stronger the Gallipoli campaign lasted nine months, okay? 500,000 Turks were involved, 410,000 Commonwealth and 79,000 French. About half of them became casualties of some kind. About officially, 86,000 Turks died. Unofficially, 253,000 Turks died. Some days, the Turks lost more than the Anzacs lost in the entire campaign. And 21,000 of them from disease. Disease, 21,000. And 28,000 British and Indian, 10,000 French, 8,700 Australians and almost 2,700 New Zealanders actually lost their lives on the peninsula. Yeah. It is very important for the Australians to be able to understand their own side, their own experience. They have to know the Turkish side. They have to empathize and identify with the Turkish side. The same goes for the Turks because it's a full experience that your side's experience is not isolated from the other side. It's a joint, mutual, common experience that unites us. Well, what all Turks know, but Australians mostly don't, is that this was a two-round fight and the Turks won both rounds. Rule Britannia, Dardanelles. Nice to see a British warship has got this far. In 1915, they got nowhere near this far. For just months before the Gallipoli landings, 
British and French warships had attempted a full frontal assault up the Dardanelles Strait with the aim of seizing Constantinople. The assault failed miserably. Carefully laid sea mines and bombardment from shore resulted in 700 Allied lives lost, sunken ships and retreat. And a local hero emerged. The last man standing had a shore battery who single-handedly loaded and fired three heavy shells that sunk one of the ships. It was round one to the Turks. I know the Turkish interest in Gallipoli was fueled by the Australians and the New Zealanders coming there because I talked to the Turkish people. I talked to Turkish people who attend the ceremonies and as a Turk, I became interested. My interest was fueled also by the New Zealand and Australian interest in the campaign. <laughs> Turks from all over the country are interested in Gallipoli. If you go to Gallipoli uh, in, a, in a weekend, especially in springtime, from the beginning of spring till the end of summer, you'll see hundreds of tour buses, school buses bring students and teachers from all over the country. So Gallipoli has sort of become a place of national pilgrimage, a national historical pilgrimage, a pl place of embracing in our uh, culture today. But what's interesting, more Turkish people turning up, coming. So it's like a, a friendly competition between the countries. So more Anzacs come, more Turks come. And Turks say, oh, they come from faraway countries, very good you know, people, they respect their you know, forefathers and you know, their you know, soldiers who fought here once. You know. So we should do the same. So making an example to us, Australian you know, behavior, making an example. So this makes Turkish people come here and in numbers more and more every year. I mean, I, I always feel that the importance of a historical event depends on the nation embracing it. If the Australians want to make Gallipoli as part of their heritage, the most important event in their heritage, in their history, they have a right to do so. As a Turk, I cannot comment on that because I cannot comment on how the Australians were affected by Gallipoli. So if the Australians want to say, this is our defining moment in our history, this is the core of our national identity, they should be able to say it. And as Turks, we should be able to say the same thing. I cannot say, no one can say, Gallipoli is more important to us than you guys. No, I don't think any country has that claim.
Interestingly enough, the, the, the Allied army was never considered an infidel army. They were considered an enemy. I don't think the Turkish army had time to question the ideological values, ideological background or the et ethnic background of their enemy. They were so concerned with stopping the enemy who had landed. It was just an enemy. It was, but the enemy was the British Empire. That was it. Simple. The mighty British Empire was the enemy of the Ottoman Empire trying to invade Istanbul. Stop. That was it. So all our information depends on the information of the officers who wrote some books after the campaign. There are not more than 50 or 40 books. And uh, the other guy, maybe you remember, uh, Kamal Bey from Ohri. Maybe you saw his photograph in the museum, blindfolded man. He did negotiation in Anzac for uh, truce. In the uh, 20s, he was a general. Atatürk sent him to Britain to bury the hatchet and have good relations with Britain. And uh, Ian Hamilton in the Times wrote an article and he says, I read that article, I met uh, Kamal Bey, you know, he was the man in Anzac did, you know, truce negotiations. And after chatting for a while about the war and all this, etc., the topic was how many Turks died in Gallipoli? <coughs> Probably you are the man who should tell me, you know, how many died. Uh, he said, we lost 350,000 Turks in Gallipoli. And he said, are you joking? No, I'm not joking, you know. And can you tell it to the British official historians, uh, because they are uh, preparing to print it at the moment. Uh, very happily, you know, he said. So at the, at the end of British official history, Aspen Oglanders, two volume published, you can see the figure, about 350,000 Turks lost in the campaign. And, and then why you don't tell it, he said and asked. He said, because if Bulgaria, Greece, our enemies, you know, if they knew we suffered very heavily here in this campaign, and Bulgaria wouldn't join us <laughs> or Germany than join allies. Yeah? So that's why we kept it as a military secrecy, didn't tell it. So I believe we lost very you know, heavily here. Well, when the Gallipoli campaign was fought, uh, the, the population in, um, in the Ottoman Empire was 14 million. And it's estimated that 500,000 Turkish troops fought at Gallipoli in those nine, nine months. So I would say uh, about one in every 28 people have a connection to Gallipoli. As I start to discuss my film on Gallipoli with them, I always hear that the person either had a grandfather or his father's father's father who fought there. In the town of Çanakkale, in the town of Gallipoli, and all those small towns in that neighborhood, in, in that coastline, all those towns were directly touched by Gallipoli. You go to a town and then it's not an exaggeration to say that almost every family has a connection to Gallipoli because most of the troops were enlisted there. I was born just behind the mountains over there, about 100 miles roughly. My grandmother used to say we could hear the sound of the guns coming from here to the village. And there were veterans, you know, 30 years ago. I took all the names of people who died here in this campaign. One of them was my uncle, great uncle, my uh, grandmother brother. And he said, if I go to Gallipoli, I don't come back. Because the idea was, people goes to Gallipoli, never come back, you know. Very small chance to survive. 
And even in letters, they never said they were in Gallipoli. If they said they were in Gallipoli, and family there would be very, very, you know, sad. And all people in town, when I was going to high school in Chanakkale, used to tell us, uh, then I was, you know, uh, imagine 60s, you know. And we kept, we were tired of seeing soldiers crossing the Dardanelles from Asian side to this side, marching, 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 always marching this way, always marching this way. But we, ne we never see them going back this way. <clears throat> so imagine drain, you know, of the people. So Turkey, like a cornered, you know, tiger here, did, you know, tremendous efforts to stop allies. What a cost. We stopped, but what a cost. And I read a German professor, history professor article in a book. The professor says, Turks proved to the world Gallipoli is their country forever because of this tremendous cost. So eight days, it's the longest battle in Gallipoli. Five days and five, uh, eight days and eight nights. Mm -hmm. Two Turkish army corps got wiped out, you know, there. 16,000 men we lost there. It was like, you know, Turkish people, you know, or Muslims praying in the mosque, row after row, you know, lying dead. And on the 9th of uh, July, Turkish headquarters here wanted ceasefire from Ian Hamilton to bury the dead, but Ian Hamilton refused. And he said, I don't agree. There was only one true ceasefire in the campaign. It happened in Anzac on the 24th of uh, May, but here no ceasefire. That's why our official historians criticize Ian Hamilton. British claim they are civilized, but they, did, they don't agree on half a day's ceasefire to bury the dead lying desperately in the battlefields. <coughs> and, uh, the other interesting thing, you say it was for democracy, for freedom. But actually, if you succeeded, you wouldn't have Turkish friends today, probably. <laughs> and uh, it was for Russia, Tsar's Russia. British agreed to give Dardanelles and Bosphorus to Russia. And I read, read a bit from Russian side, and the uh, revolutionist Lenin's, you know, later on said, uh, it was not criticizing Gallipoli campaign, it was not for democracy, it was for Tsar. So if you succeed, Tsar would be still there, maybe, in Russia. So it was for Tsar's Russia. The story of the Gallipoli campaign is taught in every school in Turkey and recently because of the resurgence of interest one scholar even proposed that Turkish students, Turkish high school students should not get a diploma unless they visit the site in person, if, unless they go there on a field trip and see where their ancestors have fought, see the cemeteries and see the battle sites and appreciate it. Bu 
Everybody has an opinion about Gallipoli. Everybody has their own perception of Gallipoli. Everybody has their own facts about Gallipoli and their own myths about Gallipoli. After Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, I think Gallipoli is the most widespread topic in contemporary Turkish history. Atatürk said to uh, uh, seeing Turkish soldiers here in the campaign, and I believe this nation w would be free forever, never under other countries' control. So, independent uh, movement actually started in my mind here in, in Gallipoli. This is the way he commented. Turkish national consciousness and identity started at Gallipoli, that's without a doubt. It's, it's not debatable. And this is the consensus in the whole country for two main reasons. First of all, it's the emergence of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk as a military commander, later a political commander. Everybody who knows Atatürk in Turkey, everybody who's aware of what Atatürk did, everybody who has studied Atatürk knows that Atatürk used the experience, the reputation he gained out of Gallipoli, the self-confidence he gained out of Gallipoli to do everything that followed Gallipoli. That's the first and main reason why the campaign is important for the Turks. It's the birth of the man who gave us our national identity. So in that sense, it's very important. The second more important, uh, the second important element why Gallipoli is important to Turks is after years of retreat and defeat within the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish army won a victory for the first time in a very, very long time. So when the Turkish people won that victory, we as the Turks said to ourselves, we can still do it. We can still make it happen. We could still win a victory if we unite, if we persevere, if we endure, and if we have good leaders. And we took that self-confidence to do everything, everything that we did after Gallipoli. <laughs> Gallipoli is a superglue that binds the nation together. I mean, when you couple Gallipoli with Atatürk, and it's hard to separate the two from each other, we have a superglue that unites us. If you take Gallipoli and Atatürk out of the Turkish national identity, the Turks have no identity. And by Gallipoli, I mean everything that's interconnected uh, to the campaign. The War of Independence, the foundation of the Turkish Republic, and so forth. All the reforms of the secular state. When you combine Gallipoli and Atatürk together, add them on top of each other, you have the essence of the Turkish national identity. And the Turks will cling to that forever with great enthusiasm. Atatürk ilkelerinden ayrılmayacağımıza, Atatürk ilkelerinden ayrılmayacağımıza, çağdaş uygarlığa geçmek için, çağdaş uygarlığa geçmek için, bütün zorlukları yeneceğimize, bütün zorlukları yeneceğimize,
an element that we shouldn't overlook is this is both a very nationalistic subject for all of us, but it's also a very internationalistic subject. It's a bond, it joins us together. So because it's our shared history, it's our shared heritage, uh, Turks feel that it's natural for them to embrace the Gallipoli campaign as much as the Australians and the New Zealanders. We're, probably we have the same history because uh, Australia uh, doesn't know how to do whether feeling part of the British Empire or separately like Republic, independent country, where the, you're discussing it. We do the same. Turkey was once part of empire, Ottoman Empire, empire disintegrated, many countries came out, Turkey was one of them. So we don't know whether we should inherit Ottoman history, deny it. So we don't know what to do, we discuss it. And so Turkish nationalism started here as well. So this was like heart of the country. If it was lost, there would be no, no Turkey today. Maybe small, you know, countries here, it's like Balkans. Many diggers say when they left Australia, it was like part of British Empire. But when they came back, Australian. So like this, you know, this is like empire's war. And then Turkish nationalism started right after that, independence war, so Turkey became independent. More or less the same story concerning both, both nations and both countries. So very, very close relations. And Australians, uh, like Turks, Turks have sympathy towards Australians, so uh, no bad feelings towards Australians here in, in this country. Mostly, majority have very nice feelings. They respect them, they like, they like them. People meet and get married. Now we have community in Australia, about 60,000 Turks living there. And Australian ladies get married to Turkish men, so <laughs> good things happening. Coming back. Just the experience, the, the Turkish people are just amazing. I, when you consider that we just got off a ferry and yet 90 years ago we were getting off a ferry to do something entirely different, yet we're greeted here by Turkish people who are just amazing people, you know. There's something special, like on the back of the shirt it's got that our brothers died together, we shared blood together and now we lie together, you know. That's what it's all about. In Australia. Oh, I was Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ankara. How have we haven't been to Ankara? Just give you the Istanbul. We have but come from Istanbul to Chennai. Hello, Australia. We are Turks boy, okay? <laughs> Learn the Turks boys. It's a very strange uh, phenomena that the Australians are in part a part of, of our national identity and we are a part of the Australian national identity because if we accept that the shores of Gallipoli as being the birthplace of the nationhood of Australia, we are a big, big part of that national identity because you guys became, the Australians became a nation by fighting against the Turks. So we are partially responsible for forging your national identity and since we consider Gallipoli as the birth of our national identity, our modern national identity, you, Australians are a part of our national identity. There's a wind that blows there at uh, Lone Pine and Anzac Cove and down at the, uh, the beach cemetery that is close enough to the spirits of, of those that came here so many years ago and stayed here. You know, I mean, I think that you've got to find a place for yourself when you're here to take it all in and to uh, comprehend the enormity of the loss of life and the sacrifice and the senselessness of war, if you like, but it goes on and probably always will go on. And when you take the time to do that, it is a spiritual experience. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, there are ghosts, that there are ghosts that, you know, come and sit on your shoulder, but it certainly is, amongst other things, a spiritual experience. It's something that I've uh, thought about as spending the night 
in a place like this, uh, in the company of uh, endless spirits, I suppose. And I must admit, you know, it, it goes through your your mind that uh, maybe it's not such a good idea. But now that I'm here, and uh, it is so uh, peaceful, and it gives you the chance to reflect upon a few things about this place. I'm quite looking forward to spending the night with whatever spirits might be floating around this sort of place. There, on the beach, on that desolate beach. Dawn filters through as they land. There on the beach, some would not even reach. Nothing unfolded as planned. Running and falling, confusion defined. He scrambles and clambers and claws. The ridges rain venom. He somehow survives, but his innocence dies on these shores. From the dearth of a trench, through the fly-ridden stench, shines the grin with a knockabout glow. Where the slouch hat is worn, a new species is born, 90 years ago. the Australian Imperial Force, the first AIF as the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. We pinned a badge to our lapels, caps, slouch hats, and went to war. To serve our nation, to serve our crown, to join with others because it had to be done. Service, sacrifice, courage, mateship. We'd come to this place as Australians and New Zealanders, as comrades in arms, It's only about eight hours now until the dawn service and probably not going to be long enough to soak it all up. Okay. That's looking? for sure, I agree. Nigger here with me, he's going to look after me. Yeah, I'll look after him, he's only a young fella. <laughs> but we're probably the oldest two here, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah. Looking around. I think they should take everyone under 25 out of here. Yeah, we'd, we'd have plenty of room to sleep. Make it a year over. Only a year over. Yeah, that's because right. we're 26. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we're in, we're in London. We figured short, short, short trip over here, once in a lifetime sort of opportunity. I think. Um, hanging out with good crew, good mates, good mates, having fun, good Aussie mates, good, yeah. Yeah. and. Um, yeah, just time. chilling, taking it easy. Um, Spreading Australian pride worldwide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taking our stuff to the streets. Oh, all the way back in primary school, mate. Um, back doing the old history classes in school. Um, yeah, it's just... Grandfathers? Yeah, yeah, relatives, the likes. Yeah. It was just something that um, I, I, I think that everyone should have a go at. Everyone, I think, should do this at Good one experience. point in their life, yeah. It's something I think is going to stick with us forever. It's some, something, something, that we're, <laughs> something that we're just going to, it's just going to be there. And we'll be able to look back at this and say, you know, hanging out with some good mates and just paying our respect to the uh, Anzacs. 
th those, that, those that gave their lives so that we can enjoy the things that we take for granted back home. I think it's absolutely fabulous. And I, d I don't know how long did the dawn service, but I wish it was about three days. I mean, I'd suck it in for three days. It's just bloody marvellous. That's all you've got to say. And the young people, to see these young people here. I've come all the way from Sydney, Australia. Now, I don't know how many miles that is. Doing kilometres, metric system. Works Brizzy, better. Brizzy. Yeah. All this way, mate, 90 years. I'll tell you what, I'm 18. Those kids younger than me here, find their guts out, digging holes. I've got no idea what it's like. Show our respect, mate. Show our respect. Isn't it great to see all these young people? So the legend's alive and absolutely well and kicking. Nick, Ross, and Sandy. Aussies. Uh, Aussies here for our uh, Anzac Day 2005. Dawn service in Gallipoli Beach. And uh, sleeping on the concrete just here. We've moved off the grass into the concrete. Because it's, uh, it's, it's a lot, a lot of... A lot better, lot better exposure to all, all, all the, what's going to go yeah. on. We've got to be close to the action. And uh, yeah, I think we might even stay up all night just so we can yeah, just be right in there and have a good, good dawn service. See, our 90th year is quite special for us, and uh, we all had family in here, so it's uh, quite a. Uh, we're only 18 years old. Ross is 24, but yeah, we still come together and come here. To, uh, to pay our respects. In the pre dawn darkness of April 25th, 1915. The warship Triumph took up a position and marked it with a single light. At 3.30, the battleship's Queen, Prince of Wales and London, gathered nearby, each carried 500 troops, the first wave. Small boats were lowered and men silently climbed aboard. Muffled orders, a splash of an oar, a rope, a job to do. There was a faint breeze, but the sea was as smooth as glass. The bows of 48 little boats created a phosphorescent wake in the green-black Aegean Sea. As they headed for shore some two and a half miles away, a ghostly sort of light everywhere, wrote one soldier. Eerie. The voyage to the shores of the Turkish Peninsula, a wild and desolate area, would take three hours. The lives of some of the young men bound for the unknown shores would last not much longer. Ninety years ago they landed on the sand and pebbles washed smooth by time and remembered in history. To a place where epic battles were fought centuries ago. To a place where our own sons fought. Ninety years later, the new sons and daughters of Australia and New Zealand would also journey there in their thousands, in peace, to see the first light of dawn as the soldiers saw it, to be chilled by the cold night air, to imagine what it was like to gather with former foes in bonds of friendship on Turkish soil, acknowledging her victory and her sadness, to understand that she also lost sons, to contemplate the cliffs and the gullies, to stand at North Beach and Anzac Cove, and to look up into the sky the beams of light, the light of men and memories. Wherever we came from, across the length and breadth of Australia and New Zealand, we would grow as people and as nations. Our men are not forgotten, and they are revered. The first streaks of dawn appeared at five minutes past four. The sun rose at 5.15. A few are legendary, like that of Simpson and his donkey. At this spectacle, even the most gentle must feel savage, and the most savage must weep. Stories of ordinary Turkish soldiers for the events at Gallipoli are as important to their history as they are to ours. They call it the Battle of Chinakoli. And Turkish heroes like Colonel Mustafa Kemal, who was sent to the heights of Şunuk Bear where the Turks were faltering under British naval bombardment and the strong stand of New Zealanders. 
sons from far away countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. On the ship, on that whispering ship, the abyss of uncertainties rest. There on the ship, in the night's eerie grip, his heart leaping forth from his chest, he senses adventure, but riding the tide is the ripple of chaos to come. His lips hold a prayer that inspires his mind to be sparing a thought for his mum. Khaki surrounds him in similar veins, character ready to flow now the landscape is forming the moment is nigh 90 years ago there on the beach on that desolate beach dawn filters through as they land there on the beach some would not even reach nothing unfolded as planned running and falling confusion defined he scrambles and clambers and claws the ridges rain venom he somehow survives but his innocence dies on those shores from the dearth of a trench through the fly ridden stench shines the grin with a knockabout glow where the slouch hat is worn a new species is born 90 years ago there on the hill that unwinnable hill, he is scared, but by God, he's committed. There on the hill, so much young blood would spill, the word sacrifice tragically fitted. In defending their homeland, the Turks never budge. The high ground is theirs to defend. The death blows a breeze that puts ice in his knees. He prepares now to meet with his end. For a moment, the sky turns a calm shade of blue, and with that, the commander yells, Go! He is hit and it burns. Then to peace, he returns, 90 years ago. There, on his grave, on that lost, lonely grave, with the others that grimly abound, there on his grave, wooden crosses stand brave, and Anzac lies under the ground. Australians, New Zealanders, brothers in arms, mates on the same team today. Goodbye and God bless Cobber. So say the words in a strength we could never betray. And this on the face of a small humble stone that in winter is lashed by the snow. Please cry no tears. He was 17 years, 90 years ago. Here in my heart, with the beat of my heart, I can't help but tremble and shiver. Here in my heart, it's so hard to depart from the pride that these spirits deliver. For the courage, the kinship, the duty, the dove, the flame of our freedom ascends. Enemies once, now we stand with respect and continue this journey as friends. Gallipoli, home to a ghost in us all from a tale pray our children will know as the legend of Anzac and lest we forget 90 years ago the legend of Anzac lest we forget 90 years ago
Oh, it's, that sums it up, isn't it? You know, it is true. We are Australian and we were there and we were proud to be there. Bloody marvellous. But sleep beckons. <laughs> I'm, I nearly fell off the perch a couple of times there. I yeah. felt myself going. Absolutely. Brilliant. But all worth it. Running on adrenaline and emotion. Well, how to do Private William McBride? Do you mind if I sit here down by your grey side? And I'll rest for a while in the warm summer sun. I've been walking all day long and I'm nearly done. I see by your gravestone you were only 19 when you joined the glory's fallen in 1916. Well, I hope you died quick and I hope you died clean. Our Willie McBride was it slow and obscene. At the end of you know, my poem, my tribute uh, to Gallipoli 90 years ago, you know, it says, for the courage, for the kinship, the duty, the dove, the flame of our freedom ascends. We're enemies once, now we stand with respect and continue this journey as friends. Gallipoli, home to a ghost in us all, from a page pray our children will know as the legend of Anzac, and lest we forget, 90 years ago. They told all the fine young men Ah, oh, when this war is over, there will be peace, and the peace will last forever in Flanders fields, at Lone Pine and Beersheba, for king and country, honor and duty. The young men fought and cursed and wept and died. They told all the fine young men, Ah, when this war is over, In your country's grateful heart, We will cherish you forever, To Brook and Alamein. Buna and Kokoda In a world mad with war Like the fathers before The young men fought, cursed and wept and died